5,782 years ago, lived a human being. His name was Adam. Adam was a regular person. He lived in interesting times in terms of human development. Uh, at that time, there was the evolution of uh, writing evolved around that time. The first sailboat, agriculture, astrology, astronomy. It's like humanity was giving its little growth spurt and beginning to pursue all kinds of areas, culture, trade, etc. that later on, a few thousands of years later, really reached their peak. But this was, you could say, the beginning. Adam, who lived in that time, was most likely a farmer, like many people in that time. And Adam was different. Why was Adam different? Adam was different because Adam had something awakened in him. What did he have awakened in him? He had a question. What is the meaning of life? That question led Adam to explore forces in reality that at first were concealed from him, but there was something inside of him that felt that these forces are, in potential at least, a door to a different layer of reality. And Adam didn't give up. He kept on pursuing it. He kept on asking this question, why am I alive? And this led him to a development of an internal tool called a Kli, that through this internal tool, a vessel, he was able to perceive a hidden layer of reality. Adam documented his findings in a book called Raziel the Angel, Raziel Hamalach. Raziel comes from the Hebrew word Raz, which means secret. And Malach is literally angel. And Adam was the first Kabbalist, almost 6,000 years ago. You could say he didn't invent Kabbalah, he discovered Kabbalah. He discovered the wisdom of Kabbalah. And he was the first person on the planet to do that. Adam was the first Kabbalist. And in today's session of Kabbalah Explained Simply, we're going to continue this tour starting from the first Kabbalist, Adam, until this very day. And we're going to touch upon many relevant, significant historical points in the development of this wisdom. So I'm Gil Shear, this is Kabbalah Explained Simply, and today's, in today's episode, we're going to cover the history of the wisdom of Kabbalah, which is the origin of Judaism, which is the origin of Christianity, and Islam, all of the monotheistic religions actually come from this wisdom, the wisdom of Kabbalah. So tune in and let's get started. Okay, hello, hello again. So I'm Gil Shear. Today we're going to cover the history of Kabbalah. Um, wait a minute, I lost the screen here. Okay, so we're going to cover the history of Kabbalah. Uh, feel free to ask, comment, anything you want throughout the session. I'll be looking at the questions. Uh, also, introduce yourself, say hi, maybe where you're from. It's always nice to see faces, well not faces literally, but like faces from all around the world, friends who are connecting and being here together. So let's jump right into it, the history of Kabbalah. So, as I already said, it started 5,782 years ago with a person named Adam. So, Adam was the first Kabbalist, and Adam was the 
first one to discover the hidden forces of reality, of nature. So let's move on and let's see what comes after Adam. So jumping almost 2,000 years forward to the same area, geographically, ancient Babylon. So humanity, 2,000 years later, is already reaching a totally different phase of humanity. Culture is developing, trade is developing. Imagine a very thriving city, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Babylon, today Iraq. And you could say the human ego reached a new level of growth, a desire to conquer, to uh, develop, to be educated, to evolve, and all egoistically. And it's an interesting time for humanity. So in this very kind of bubbly, hip city, filled with people and culture and uh, religions, many religions and many, many gods, lived a person named Abraham. Now, Abraham came from a prestigious family who was connected to the leadership, son of Terach. Uh, and Abraham, according to the legend, he worked in an idol store selling idols. That was the common uh, thing to do there, to worship idols. Every force was had a different god related to it. So if you want wind, you pray to this god. If you want sun, you pray to that god. If you want money, you pray to this god, and so on and so on. And, and Abraham, working in Terach's idol store, felt something is off here. What did Abraham feel? He felt that all of these forces are actually a single force, that all of nature is actually a single force. There aren't many forces, there aren't many gods, there is only one force, one nature, or one God, if you will. And Abraham, too, like Adam, discovered this force, discovered the forces of nature revealed a hidden layer of reality, documented his findings in a book called Sefer Yetzirah, the book of creation. And Abraham felt an inner need to make this knowledge, this wisdom available to anyone that wanted to hear about it, to anyone that possibly shared a similar internal feeling that there is something beyond the idols that they're worshipping. There is not many forces, but a single force, and Abraham opened his tent to anyone that wanted to learn about the laws of nature. Now, people joined him, thousands, from Babylon and other nations as well, they came to learn from Abraham. That group of people later on became the people of Israel. That group of people later on became what we know today as Jews, Judaism. So the foundation of Judaism is really the wisdom of Kabbalah. Abraham was a Kabbalist. The people that came to study from him were not associated with any specific religion. The only common thing they all had is they wanted to understand the laws of nature. And that is the foundation of that group of people, the people of Israel, which, by the way, in Hebrew, the word Israel is built of two words, Israel. The first word is Yashar, which means straight. And the second word, El, means God, Creator. So straight to the Creator. And that is that group of people. Those that wanted to go straight to that force of nature. Straight to understand it, to research it, to connect with it, to be one with it. So Abraham was really not just the founder of Israel. He is the father of all monotheistic religions. 
as you know, Abraham, um, Abraham's son Isaac, later on gave birth to the Jewish people, and his son Ishmael from his wife Hagar later gave birth to the Islam. So both Islam and Judaism, they both come from Abraham, who was a Kabbalist. So this is 4,000 years ago, approximately. Abraham, a great Kabbalist, who had one mission in life to explore this force of reality and to spread his findings to anyone that wanted to hear. So this is Abraham. Let's jump a little forward to Moses. So we're going approximately 700 years forward. The years that you'll see here are more or less approximations. Moses, maybe it was 3,200 years ago. Uh, so we're going to the next Kabbalist, Moses. So Moses, a great leader who led this group of people of Israel out of Egypt and into Israel, Egypt being the forces of the ego dominated by Pharaoh, dominated by the desires to receive, and he led the people back into Israel, which is a corrected desire. So the land of Israel really resembles a desire, the same desire we mentioned before, Israel Yashar El, straight to the Creator. Of course, Moses wrote the Bible, the Bible, best-selling book of all times, is not a history book, it's not a book of morals, it is a book written purely in code that discusses only internal forces between the created being, humans, and the forces of nature. And every single word that's written in the Bible discusses only these forces, two forces to be precise, plus and minus. The only two forces, in fact, that exist in reality. So this is Moses, approximately 3,300 years ago, and we're jumping a little bit forward to an interesting time, the first temple, 3,000 years ago, Temple of Solomon. At this time, the people of Israel all were Kabbalists. They all had spiritual attainment. They all were in contact with this upper force, with the forces of nature. They all had an additional sense that enabled them to experience an additional layer of reality, a layer that is always in existence, but that is concealed. And it's concealed unless one develops an internal device called a kli or a vessel that enables to perceive an additional layer of reality. And it's no different than layers that we have in this world as well even. I mean, it's no different that the, in the room you're in now, there are probably uh, waves that you can't pick up with your own senses. And if you have a device like a cell phone, then you can pick up cellular waves. So you need the right device. And with the right device, you can connect to all kinds of forces, frequencies, energies that without the correct device, you wouldn't be able to pick up. Same with the radio, same with many things. So similarly, we're in a reality that there is more than our five senses can perceive. And in order to perceive the additional layers of reality that are all around us, we simply need to develop a device, a kli. And Adam was the first one to develop that device. Abraham developed that device as well. As a result, he perceived these laws of nature and he taught anyone that wished to. And that group of people that came to him that later on multiplied and became three million, they are the people of Israel. So it's not a question of who you're born to. It's a question of what your desire is. And that is true today as well. If your desire is to discover these forces, then you can be considered Israel. And if you're born to a Jewish mother, but you have no such desires, then maybe you're not considered Israel. And 3,000 years ago, in the time of the first temple, the Temple of Solomon, all of these people of Israel 
had spiritual attainment on the level called Chaya. It's a certain spiritual degree. And jumping a little bit forward to the second temple, the first temple reached its destruction, and the second temple um, was built with the attainment level Neshama. This was approximately 2,090 years ago. That's when it was destructed, 70 uh, BC. That's when it was destructed. Not long after that started Christianity, which was from Jesus from Nazareth, a Jew, a Jewish teacher, uh, not a Kabbalist. And that was the start of a religion that indirectly came from Judaism, that, well, not indirectly, you could say directly came from Judaism, and Judaism directly came from the wisdom of Kabbalah. So moving a little bit forward, uh, let's jump a little bit forward to 1800 years ago, the time of Rashbi. Rashbi, a great, huge Kabbalist, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, author of the Book of Zohar, but he didn't write it himself. He wrote it with Idra Rabba, with a great assembly. That's what Idra Rabba means. And his great assembly was a group of 10. 10 of his students, also great Kabbalists, actually nine of his students, together with him they were 10, resembling the 10 Sefirot. Together they wrote the Book of Zohar. The, the writings of the Book of Zohar came from a very, very special connection that they built among each other. And the Book of Zohar is written mainly through allegoric tongue and tale. If you read the Book of Zohar, you'll find all kinds of writings there about mountains and possibly rivers, in addition to some Kabbalistic terms. And really, all it talks about is internal states, and it does that through allegory and through tale. So it's a very difficult book to interpret and understand, although you don't really need to understand it in order to use it. You don't need to know how your phone is built inside in order to be able to press the buttons. Same with Kabbalistic writings. The Book of Zohar holds in it infinite spiritual potential. In order to use this book, you simply need to calibrate your intention. You don't have to understand what's written there. You don't have to know you simply need to calibrate your intention. And this is 1800 years ago, approximately uh, Rashbi and his students. Many scholars today uh, say that the Zohar was written later on, approximately 700 years ago, and they base it on different academic findings. However, Kabbalists, uh, say that this was written 1800 years ago and Kabbalists speak only from spiritual attainment and not from fragmented pieces of evidence. And even though Kabbalah in most cases has no contradiction with science, in some cases uh, Kabbalah has more information than science currently has and we're going with the Kabbalists here. So Rashbi, 1800 years ago, Idra Rabba, the book of Zohar, a significant milestone in the development of the wisdom of Kabbalah, mainly because this book, so powerful, it not, it wasn't written for, for, for 1800 years ago, it was written for our time, actually today, it added an incredible layer of light to the entire system, bringing the human desire closer and closer to evolving to its final spiritual state, which we're experiencing today. So this was Rashbi 1800 years ago. I'm going to take a quick pause to see if we have any questions. See, we, we do have some questions. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, there are all kinds of questions, historical questions here. We're not going to go too deep into history that isn't 
related to the evolution of this wisdom, because otherwise we'd be here for many, many, many hours. Every point in the timeline here can of course be elaborated. And also it's not a, a complete timeline because that too would take hours. So these are significant milestones in the development of the wisdom of Kabbalah. These are not the only Kabbalists along the, this timeline. There are more Kabbalists, many more in fact, some of which are concealed and some of which are revealed throughout this timeline. There are many Kabbalists which we're not mentioning like Ramchal, like Rashash, like Ramban, like Rambam, Maimonides, and many, many more, more Kabbalists that we're not going to mention on this timeline. doesn't mean that these are the only Kabbalists, but uh, the Kabbalists that are presented here, the milestones that are presented here are significant to the development of the wisdom. And let's keep going. So we have Rashbi, 1800 years ago, Book of Zohar. Next step, we're going to the Ari. So just by chance, today is the your site, the day of the death of the Ari. That's today. The Ari was the most important Kabbalist of all times. That's what I heard my teacher, Kabbalist Dr. Michael Lightman, say this morning uh, in a lesson about the Ari. And he was revolutionary. Until the time of the Ari, all of the d writings about the wisdom of Kabbalah were, of course, accurate, but they weren't understandable. They weren't, they couldn't be used by people, only by Kabbalists of the highest degrees. And what the Ari did in his writings, the Tree of Life, that's, his main book, there's also Gate of Intentions and some more books that he wrote, but the Tree of Life is what he's most known for because that holds in it the scientific blueprint of the spiritual world, the structure of the Ten Sefirot. That's what you see here. It's not that Kabbalists beforehand didn't mention these Ten Sefirot. They did, even in the Book of Creation it's mentioned, but the Ari, he took this structure, he broke it down, he put it over a few thousands of pages in a manual, a scientific blueprint of the spiritual worlds, a blueprint that can be studied theoretically by, by anyone. I say theoretically because there still was required an additional step in order to make it more accessible, but he laid the foundations and by that, he was revolutionary. He did it at a very young age, before under the age of 40. Um, before the Ari, it was, the wisdom was explained mainly through allegory and tales similar to the Book of Zohar. Uh, after he passed away, he gave the instruction that only Chaim Vital, his student, can engage in this wisdom. And in fact, the Ari didn't write a single word of these writings. They were all written by his student, Chaim Vital, who documented for years every word his teacher said. And after the Ari passed, he put it in writing. Um, what else can we say about the Ari? Well, he was orphaned at a relatively young age. He learned Kabbalah from his uncle. And... You could say it was one of the most significant milestones in the development of the wisdom as it brought it closer to the masses. Okay, so this is the Ari. Let's take another step forward to the next milestone. Okay, a couple of hundred years later, the Baal Shem Tov. So the Baal Shem Tov, also a great Kabbalist, he was the father, he is the father of Hasidut, Hasidism. Now Hasidism in its origin was really a method to bring Kabbalistic concepts to the masses through introducing ideas that were not common before, ideas like adhesion, meaning that human beings need to reach a state 
of being fully connected to the forces of nature. He introduced, he widely introduced concepts like intention, that intention is something that should be pursued every second of the day, all the time. And he embedded this through Hasidism, which is basically bringing Kabbalah to the masses. And this is Baal Shem Tov. He, he too was a revolutionary. He was the first one that brought in practice the wisdom of Kabbalah to the masses. So this is the Baal Shem Tov. Jumping a couple of hundred years forward to Baal HaSulam. So Baal HaSulam, as you can see a lot closer to us, there's actually a real live photo of him. This is Baal HaSulam in this photo here. So Baal HaSulam, also known as Yehuda Ashlag, he was a great Kabbalist that lived in the previous century. In fact, he is the incarnated soul of the Ari, who is in fact the incarnated soul of Rashbi, who is in fact the incarnated soul of Moses, who is in fact, you guessed it, the incarnated soul of Abraham, who is in fact, yes, the incarnated soul of Adam. So this soul kept on reincarnating and bringing the wisdom closer and closer to humanity. And Bala Sulam took the book of Zohar and he wrote an interpretation to it. The, that interpretation is widely used today. He also wrote the interpretation to the Ari's Tree of Life. So the Ari wrote the blueprint. And as I mentioned before, in theory, he opened it up to the masses, but it was still difficult and not approachable by the masses. And Bala Sulam built a ladder. That's where his name comes from. Hasulam. Sulam means ladder. So Baal Hasulam literally means the owner of the ladder. He's called the owner of the ladder because he took the writings of the Ari, he took the book of Zohar, and he wrote an interpretation, an addition to it, that is like a ladder to the spiritual reality. Baal Sulam was also revolutionary in, in, in that his writings are accessible by anyone today in our time who wants to climb the spiritual ladder. So this is Bala Sulam, a very significant milestone in the development of this wisdom. And this brings us to today, which is approximately, let's say, the year 2000, approximately plus minus. So we have Rabash, also known as Rav Baruch Shalom Halavi Ashlag. He is the son and successor of Bala Sulam. He added the practical implementation in a group. That is the writings of Rabash. He took everything that preceded him and he added a practical layer that enables anyone today to practice spirituality and develop according to the method of Bala Sulam. His teacher and successor, who is actually my teacher as well, and possibly yours if you're watching this, Kabbalist Dr. Michael Lightman, who is the founder and leader today of the organization Bnei Baruch, or Kabyu. Kabyu is part of Bnei Baruch, a worldwide organization with one mission, to teach and spread the wisdom of Kabbalah to anyone that wants to hear about it. Similar to what all Kabbalists try to do, similar to what Abraham did when he opened his tent, similar to what the Ari did, similar to what Baal Sulam did, similar to what Rabash did. That is the vision and mission of the organization founded by Kabbalist Dr. Michael Lightman, the organization called Bnei Baruch, Sons of Baruch, 
Baruch is Dr. Latman's teacher, the Rabash. Rav Baruch Shalom Elvi Ashlag. So Bnei Baruch is sons of Baruch, sons of the Rabash. And you could say that's the end of this lineage of Kabbalists until this very day. And it is probably the end of the development as it evolved from, it's called in Kabbalah, from mouth to mouth, from teacher to student, in our times today, that is no longer the way it's developing. Our teacher, Kabbalist Dr. Michael Lightman, is spreading this wisdom massively, publicly. That's also what we attempt to do in Kabu, make this wisdom available to everyone and anyone. And that's what we attempt to do here on our social media channels and Facebook, on YouTube and everywhere. And we are at a very, very special time because everything the Kabbalists have done for almost 6,000 years, they did not do it for their time. They did it for our time. They did it for a time where the human desire will reach a point of satiation in its evolution, a point where it has grown from the time of Adam, where the human desire started evolving, desires for, in addition to bodily desires, in addition to desires for food, for sex, for family, which are basically animalistic desires. So in the time of Adam and Abraham, where the human desire started evolving to want social desires like money, like power, like knowledge, like fame, etc. And that is a natural part of the human development. But in our time today, it's reaching a point of satiation. This desire is no longer being fulfilled. Many, many people are beginning to feel this emptiness, this void inside. This question for the meaning of life, for the purpose of life, for the nature of their existence. And these questions, they come from a point within that's been concealed for almost 14 billion years. And this point has been sitting there quietly, dormant, evolving, passively in a way, waiting for the right time to erupt. And that time is now. So everything Kabbalist wrote, everything they did, the Book of Zohar, the writings of the Ari, Tree of Life, everything was designed for our time. The Ari writes that the first point in time where it will begin, the human desire will begin to open up was at his time. And the second point is around the year 1995, which is approximately the year that Bnei Baruch was founded. So there is a lot happening in the world today. And even though it seems chaotic, and it does seem chaotic, in fact, it's all purposeful and it's all leading to a, it's all leading humanity to a higher point of evolution. So I'll take a quick pause, take, see if there are any questions. Um, Let's take a look. I'm sure there are. Okay. So I hopefully I already answered Debbie, who will succeed Dr. Lightman in advancing this teaching. So unlike this wisdom has evolved for thousands of years from teacher to student, passed down secretly even in our time today, it is no longer being passed down from teacher to student, but from teacher to students. So Kabbalist Dr. Michael Lightman is passing on this method to all of his students. And just like you see here on this channel, I'm teaching today. Last week, Marcus taught. A week after that, Leo is going to teach. And then Tony and Asaf and all of our Kabu instructors. And there is no one single student that will be leading. It will be a group of Kabbalists, of students, us, you, together who will evolve spiritually. Uh, okay, so Sam, does Kabbalah believe in incarnation or reincarnation? Yes, it absolutely does, and it explains it in depth. 
if Ruth or Rachel, if you can post in the chat to Sam the link to Kabbalah Explained Simply about reincarnation, that'll be great. Let's see what else. Okay, Mark is asking, isn't the soul between us and there is only one soul of Adam HaRishon? Okay, so that's common confusion. Adam, who lived 5,782 years ago, is not the soul of Adam HaRishon. Adam HaRishon is a soul that existed before time, actually, before the Big Bang, before matter erupted. It's in the world of Atzilut, and it's the collective soul. It's where we came from, and it's where we're actually heading. To be this one collective soul, built of all of the individuals, you don't lose your, your individualism, you find it within that collective soul, to be precise. So, let's see what else we have. Uh, another question from Debbie Bra Brady. There are many teach teachings that call theirs Kabbalah. What is the best way to distinguish between those and the true teachings? Great question. It's not easy. Uh, I did give a blueprint of how to, how to examine that, how to check if a Kabbalist is a real teacher. You can find that if you search Reveal Kabbalah Secrets, I think, on YouTube. Hold on, let me just double check that. And I explained there a method of how to check. Yeah, here it is. I'll even throw the link in the chat. Uh, I actually threw the link in the chat to you, Rachel, Ruth, Linda, so you can grab it from there. Uh, there in this video, I explain exact precise steps of how to identify authentic Kabbalistic teachings. Let's keep going. Amani is asking, why is Kabbalah still more concealed with growing of egoism in humanity? We're at a point of transition. That's a great question. We're, we are at a point of transition. This point is, you could say, part of humanity is already awakened, is already, even if it's not yet felt, you know, depression is uh, probably the number one pandemic, way more than COVID, more deaths than COVID as well. And depression simply comes from an inner feeling of, of emptiness. There are different forms of depression, of course. I'm not an expert on that, but I do know that a lot of that comes from lack of hope, lack of understanding of purpose, of where this is leading to. That's also why among religions, by the way, the depression rate is lower because people have purpose and that's in fact maybe we'll talk a little bit about religions as part of the kind of historical development let me grab back the timeline again let's look at it and maybe i'll add in a few more uh, points about religion uh let's see okay so um judaism around here around 4000 years ago christianity well actually judaism not 4000 years ago judaism uh a little bit later on kabbalah 4000 years ago approximately when abraham brought it to the masses he was the one that made it into a much broader uh method that anyone who wants to study can study unlike during the time of Adam when it was only him by himself so Abraham brought it to many people and during the destruction of the second temple 2000 years ago so we're looking about here around the same time that Christianity began the destruction of the temple resembled the loss of the spiritual degree of that group of people, that group of Kabbalists, which were called Israel. And at that time, you could say the entry into exile, 2000 years of exile 
for that group of people, the Jewish religion really had its role fulfilled by creating a set of laws which are based on the Kabbalistic laws of nature. So every law in, in Judaism is based on a Kabbalistic concept, principle, but it's based on that as a very, you could say, weak spiritual force. It's called holy still, meaning if we're talking about four levels of development, still vegetative, animate, and speaking. So Kabbalah leads a person to the highest degree of the speaking of holiness, meaning this, of understanding the forces of nature, and Judaism keeps a person at least on the level of holy still. And the purpose of the Jewish religion over that time in exile was to keep that group of people, former Kabbalists, connected to their origin, have them spread among the nations and integrate with all of humanity. And that is actually the birth of the collective spark. So the fact that the Jews were scattered around the world, again, when I say Jews, you're probably thinking of some nation. Don't think of it as a nation built on any ideology other than a desire to understand and explore the laws of nature. That is the only foundation of that group of people, not any kind of land or anything like that, only an ideology to connect to the forces of nature. And the, f the period of exile of 2000 years was in order to integrate these sparks with all of humanity and the end of that time of exile, according to what Kabbalist wrote about, is now the end of 2,000 years of exile. And at this point in time, many people in humanity are beginning to sense that inner question, what is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? I was actually looking at, at a, the search trends of that phrase, meaning of life. And in the last 20 years, it is just going up more and more and more people are searching for this are trying to understand what's going on here why are they alive on the other hand some people are still not there yet we see it that people are satisfied by money by power by knowledge and that's fine if that's where they are at nothing we can do about it but if you're already feeling this awakening then you can accelerate the entire development of all of humanity if you begin to connect to these forces of nature. So also Christianity and also Islam, they all have their origins in the wisdom of Kabbalah, in fact. They say that Christianity and Islam have their origins in Judaism, but in fact Judaism's origin is the wisdom of Kabbalah. So Kabbalah is the origin of all monotheistic religions. Okay, let's see uh, what else. Wasn't Maimonides a Kabbalist? Yes, Katya, I mentioned that before. Maimonides was a Kabbalist. Again, if that wasn't clear, this timeline does not present all of the Kabbalists. There are many, many thousands of Kabbalists throughout these 6,000 years. This was just pointing out significant ones and milestones which led the wisdom to where it is today. So yes, Maimonides was a great Kabbalist. Uh, let's see what else. Why is there so much violence in the Pentateuch, in the Tanakh? Great question. It's a representation of the egoistic forces, not of, again, it's not a history book. Does it describe historical events? To an extent, yes. And the violence is the representation of the egoistic desire, which wants to devour everything and everyone and eventually lead to its own death similar to cancerous cells which are violent cells which want to consume the other cells and everything around them and the result of that is the death of the body and the cancerous cell that is the ego that is the violence 
that we see in the Tanakh. Okay, um, let's see what else. Why was the Bible written in code? Question from Julie. Why not a straight on teaching about the upper force? Simple. 3,000 years ago, humanity was not yet ready for the wisdom. That's why I said all of the Kabbalists, they wrote in concealment. They didn't spread it to the masses. The first Kabbalist to spread it to the masses, or at least, well, actually, it wasn't even him who spread it. It was his students. But the first Kabbalistic writings to be openly spread to the masses was the Ari, without great success. The first Kabbalist to succeed in spreading this concept to the masses was Baal Shem Tov, and that was only about 200, 250 years ago. And that is a time where the human d desire has reached a point where it's able to ask and, and get answers to these questions. Similar how you wouldn't explain to a, to a three-year-old what you would explain to an 18-year-old. Explain to a three-year-old, I don't know, the war between some two countries, Ukraine and Russia. You can't really explain it, nor would you want to. The child isn't developed enough, evolved enough. He doesn't understand the questions or the answers. And that's how humanity was for thousands of years. They, the human desire wasn't yet evolved enough to ask the questions or to hear the answers, except for a selected few. Uh, Debbie's asking, so Israel isn't necessarily a country. Well, Israel is also a country, but in Kabbalah, the concept of Israel does not refer to a country. A country is a geographical border. It is simply land. It is matter. It is nothing to do with spirituality. In Kabbalah, the word Israel resembles one thing, a desire to connect to the forces of nature. Yisrael, Yashar, Kel. Okay, where did yoga start? I don't know, but it is written that Abraham gave gifts to the Easterners and that's where the methods of the East developed. So I heard. But I'm no expert in that field, so I won't elaborate on that. Okay, Sam Lima. Do the Big Bang Theory and the Point in the Heart, are they similar? Uh, they're... I don't know if you would say similar, but there's definitely no contradiction. Like I said, Kabbalah and science do not contradict. On the contrary, they go hand in hand. The Big Bang is simply the two forces, spiritual forces, the force of bestowal and the force of reception, the force of bestowal being, being the light, creator you can call it the force of reception being the created being these two forces together erupted almost 14 billion years ago and that is the formation of matter and everything we know today evolved from these two forces the point in the heart is really the the minus force the force of reception integrated with a force of bestowal. So the point in the heart, you could say, is the beginning of this plus force within the force of reception. So we're entirely built of a matter, which is a desire to receive pleasure. That's what motivates us. That's what makes us move. If I move my hand, it's simply because... By moving it, I will receive greater pleasure, even unconsciously. If I take a sip of water, it's because I will receive pleasure. If I give something to someone, it's because I will receive pleasure. If I take something from someone, it's because I will receive pleasure. That's what we are. We're beings of reception, of pleasure. That's our desire to receive. Within that desire is a spark, a point from the very thought of creation, from the very beginning of time. That point has been dormant for 14 billion years until today. Now it's been awakened gradually. 
in humanity, as time passes, this desire will further develop. Okay, what else? Now, uh, let's see. Um, does Kabbalah magic exist? How does Kabbalah explain the use of magic? I don't know how you describe magic. For me, magic is the evolution of the desire to receive, to bestow. That's like magic. It's not, in fact, magic because when you know the system behind it, you realize that it's not magic at all. Although it can seem like magic, just like a light switch for a prehistoric person can seem like magic. You press a button and the light goes on. That's magic. No, it's not magic. It's just a mechanism that seems like magic to someone that has no idea of how it's built. So in Kabbalah, there is no magic. What might seem like magic is simply lack of understanding of the laws of nature. When you understand the laws of nature, similar to when you learn about how a light circuit work, electric circuits, then you won't be surprised when you click a button and the light goes on because you know that you close an electric circuit, current flows, etc. And it's no longer magic. Similar here, there is no magic in Kabbalah. There is only science. But this needs to be discovered and developed. And I want to take a couple of minutes to tell you about uh, the last point in the timeline. I actually mentioned it, but I didn't really elaborate on it. But I do want to elaborate on it a little bit now. And that is uh, this point here. So Bnei Baruch Kabiu was built the founder of Bnei Baruch is Kabbalist Dr. Michael, like, Dr. Michael Lightman, like I said. And Kabiu was built according to his vision by his students with one goal. To be an environment to develop that point in the heart. So if you feel that you have that point in the heart and you want to develop it, you want to put it in a place where it can grow and thrive and receive light and fulfillment and energy, then I invite you to join Kabiu. Hundreds of students who are doing this on a daily basis, who are practicing this wisdom. Let me just give you a quick snapshot of, um, of Kabiu. So here it is. This is Kabiu. In it, you'll find courses and webinars, a community, everything you need to evolve spiritually. Uh, right now, we're going to finish this session and we're going to move on to uh, a Zoom session exclusive for our Kabiu students. So if you're in Kabiu, we're going to see you in a few minutes in the Zoom session. You'll be able to ask anything live on Zoom and interact with instructors and students, etc. cetera. Uh, so if you're in Cub U, you can check out our courses on different topics, Blueprint of Creation, the Emergent Universe, even on topics that are semi-related like love, what is love according to nature and the science of human emergence and how we're wired to connect and a variety of courses here, the Book of Zohar and Meaning of Life. And we have a VOD section, which you can check out um and enjoy hundreds of hours of inspiring kabbalistic content and all of this is available to anyone that joins kabu so if you want to join kabu just click the links in the chats uh, the price is not high for the value that you get if you sign up annually it's under ten dollars a month for everything that i mentioned here and you get a 14 day free trial. So for 14 days, you don't pay anything. So you can try it out. If you don't like it, you can cancel before the 14 days end and you won't be charged a thing. And even if you get charged and you change your mind, don't worry about it, reach out. We have full confidence in this environment and product. So you should really feel free to give it a chance. And if you're searching, if you feel that you have this point in you and you want to give it a chance to develop it, then I encourage you to sign up 
and join Kabu. And you can do that even right now and join the Kabu session. And that's it for today. So I'm Gil Shear. This is Kabbalah Explained Simply. Today we spoke about the history of the wisdom of Kabbalah, which is the origin of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and all monotheistic religions. And it's the origin of a point inside of us that aspires and yearns to reach something higher. And actually, before we conclude, I want to share one more thing with you. We have a very, very special event happening not long, not, not very far away, on the 9th to 11th of September. We're having our annual Cub U retreat which is an incredible event, hybrid, so it's happening upstate New York and also in the virtual reality. If you can come physically, I'll see you there in upstate New York. It's really an incredible experience. It's uh, three days of immersion, of spiritual, uh, spiritual attainment, of, of connection with others, of lessons, of workshops, of inspiration, of intellectual... Uh, upliftment, uh, you name it. It's it's my favorite event of the year. I'm going to be there, upstate New York. Hopefully you can make it too. Check out the link in the chat and hopefully I'll see you there. So that's it for today. I'm Gil Shear. See you guys.